Thank you to all of our panelists today, Caitlin Robish, Luis Meese, uh, Matthew Raskin, and Jenny Schutz for joining us today. Um, today's event is going to be split into two sections. The first will consist of a moderated discussion between our moderator, Professor Leeper, and our panelists. And the second is going to be a question and answer where students can ask any questions that you might have for our alums. I'd like to now introduce our moderator, Professor Eric Leeper. So Professor Leeper is the Paul uh, Goodlow McIntyre Professor in Economics at the University of Virginia, a position he began in 2018. He is also a visiting scholar at the Federal Bank of Atlanta and, a, and an occasional advisor to the European Central Bank. His research focuses on theoretical and empirical models of macroeconomic policy with special emphasis on monetary fiscal policy interactions. And his recent research examines the economic impacts of government spending and the modeling of the fiscal limit and sovereign risk. So we hope you all enjoy this panel. And now the floor is yours, Professor Leeper. Well, welcome everybody to this year's uh, 2021 Economics Undergraduate Career Forum and also to our four guests, uh, Luis, Jenny, Caitlin, and uh, Matthew. Uh, as most of you know, the job market is um, sort of unusually weak right now. Unemployment is at about 6.3%, uh, which is significantly better than it was in April, but uh, still uh, quite a bit higher than it was a year ago. Despite the weak labor market, um, economics majors coming out of UVA uh, have been finding a host of different kinds of jobs and um, across a broad range of occupations, you know, there are private sector jobs, government jobs, uh, nonprofits, international organizations, think tanks, and so forth. Um, and the fields include banking and finance, consulting, environmental sciences, uh, healthcare, IT, law, the list goes on and on. And the sorts of corporations or organizations that they've been finding jobs in include uh, Accenture, Amazon, Bain and Company, Booz Allen Hamilton, Deloitte, the Federal Reserve System, Google, IMF, Oracle, Urban Institute, and the Department of State. Um, so Outcomes report that our graduating classes from uh, 2013 onward are on uh, the website if you want to check out uh, what the uh, more detail about where people have been getting placed. So for those of you who are considering an economics major at UVA, um, let me tell you a little bit about what it uh, consists of. So there, there are the foundational courses of micro, macro, and econometrics. Um, and then once you've taken those, you can select advanced coursework that might emphasize more applied micro or uh, go down the international or macro uh, channel. And so economics majors build uh, strong theoretical and analytical skills, as well as uh, they learn how to work with data. Um, and at the same time, we try to encourage good communication skills, which are essential in any work environment, even in teaching, believe it or not. Um, and so what we like to think we're doing is we're trying to get students to learn how to think both broadly and critically. And critically means that you have something substantive to say. It doesn't mean you simply criticize, that you have a basis for what, you're, what your criticism is about. Um, so I'd like to get a sense of who is in the room among the students. And so if you would enter your year and major in the chat, um, that would be really helpful. And we get a sense of uh, who exactly is attending. Um, so the alums that we're fortunate enough to have with us today uh, represent both the breadth and diversity uh, that we find in uh, economics majors job placements in general. So we have both uh, industry and uh, 
public institutions and nonprofit institution. So let me uh, welcome the guests. And uh, the guests are, as I said, Caitlin, Luis, uh, Jennifer, Jenny, sorry, and uh, Matthew. And what I'd like to do now is just start with some questions uh, and I'll go through them one at a time and then each uh, panelist can respond initially for a couple minutes maybe. Um, so if you could briefly share with us how you came to be in the job that you now have, tell us about your title, what the organization is and what, you, what you're trying to do in your business. Um, and as I said earlier, the, the more concrete and specific you can be, uh, I think the more helpful it would be. So should we start with maybe Caitlin since she's on the top of my screen? <laughs> sure, happy to. Hi everyone, um, it's nice to see faces at the top. I'm Caitlin Robish. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives at an organization called Children's Aid in New York City. Um, Children's Aid is a large social services organization. We're multi-service. We are one of the largest foster care agencies in New York. We also have a healthcare wing, um, an education wing, teachers, we work in schools. Um, and we also have a central office that's quite large. And the reason I think my economics background plays into my role here is because the organization has an initiative to make sure one of our large strategic initiatives is to make sure we're using data appropriately across those foster care, education, and healthcare um, wings of the agency. So I came on about a year and a half, two years ago to lead the integration of all of our data systems and programs with our central agency work. Um, previously, I'd worked for the Department of Ed and another nonprofit in the city focusing on uh, service learning in schools. So my background is economics, but also education and public service. Luis, would you like to go next? <laughs> yes, happy to. I've got a screaming eight-year-old in the background. Sorry if you hear him. Um, yeah, hey everyone, uh, real happy to be here. Thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so Luis Mize, I am the Senior Director of Purpose Initiatives at Nike Inc. Uh, here in Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, it's purpose initiatives essentially is, is corporate social responsibility, and that's the way that we say it. And there are three pillars to it. It's environmental sustainability, so everything that Nike is doing to be a good steward of the environment. There's community impact, so everything that Nike is doing to be a good steward of the communities where we operate and where our employees live. And then you have diversity and inclusion, so everything that we're doing to make sure that the ball bounces the same for everyone and that they're equal playing fields. Uh, in terms of my interest in it, I've, I've always been interested in the greater good. I've always been interested in, in doing good for others. You know, I grew up in Arlington, Virginia, and my mom worked on, on the Hill, and she always brought her work home with her. And I was just always fascinated by, um, you know, why things are the way that they are, why there are some people that have a lot and others that don't, um, you know, why can, when you break it down, you know, different types of people have more than others and what that looks like and how we can all kind of get a bigger piece of the pie. And so um, I was really interested in that, studied obviously economics at UVA, um, but that, that's kind of what, what I've made my career uh, in. And I've tried to be really intentional about getting different perspectives on that. So I've worked in the government sector, I've worked in NGOs, uh, and now you know working in the, in the private sector with corporate. So I was at Walmart before I came to Nike. Uh, so yeah, uh, happy to uh, kind of talk about, you know, um, how, how econ and kind of how that's, you know, kind of the different um, uh, things that I learned during my time at UVA have, have, have helped me along to where I'm at now. Thank you. Matt. Eric. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Matt Raskin. Um, I am a senior policy advisor in the markets group of the New York Fed. Um, I, uh, I have been um, at the New York Fed since 2007. Um, so the Federal Reserve is the, the country's central bank. We are responsible for uh, monetary policy uh, with the goal of um, maximum employment and price stability, uh, for the stability of the financial system, um, for uh, supervising 
uh, banks uh, to promote their safety and soundness, um, and for managing the country's payment systems. The, the way the Federal Reserve System um, is structured, there's a board of governors, which is in DC, and then there are 12 regional banks of which the New York Fed is one. But the New York Fed's a little unique in that um, we are responsible for implementing monetary policy. Uh, and that means that, you know, when you read the newspaper that the Federal Reserve met today and changed interest rates, um, that, that does not happen by decree. Uh, or when you read that the Federal Reserve announced that it would be purchasing X billion dollars in treasury securities, those are actual transactions that the Federal Reserve undertakes um, with private market participants. And the New York Fed has responsibility for, um, for conducting those transactions. And those are done out of the markets group and, and on the trading desk, which is, which is where I work as, a, as an advisor. Um, so what that means is that we are uh, sort of at the nexus of uh, macroeconomics, uh, monetary policy, and financial markets. And um, because we have this responsibility for implementing monetary policy and engaging with um, private market participants in doing that, we also collect a lot of information and insight about what's going on in financial markets. And one of our other responsibilities is for making sure that we pass that information along so that policymakers within the Federal Reserve um, are apprised on important developments and able to make good decisions about their monetary policy. Um, I find it fascinating. It is um, filled with intellectual challenge. And if you're interested in what's going on in the world, um, uh, geopolitically, um, in terms of financial markets uh, and the like, uh, to me, there's no more, more interesting place to, to work. So I, I think um, there was some reference earlier to, the, to the, the COVID episode and what that might have meant for some of us in our work. And if, if that comes up, I'd be happy. I mean, it, it's been an, um, a, a really remarkable episode, not just in terms of working remotely, but also in terms of what the Federal Reserve has done over the, over the last year. And so I'd be happy to share some of my experience around that. Thank you. Um, and our last panelist, Jenny. Sure. Thanks for inviting me to be here. It's good to see all of your faces on little screen boxes. Um, so I am a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, uh, which is a think tank located in Washington, DC. Um, think tanks are sort of an odd, uh, an odd kind of halfway point between academia and the public sector. Um, so it, it's sort of literally our job to try to come up with new policy ideas that change the world. Um, I was in academia for a number of years and did research papers. I worked at the Federal Reserve uh, Board of Governors in DC um, before coming to Brookings. And my job now is somewhere in between those two roles. So like academics, we do research and we write papers, but our target audience is not other academics and researchers. Our target audience is policymakers, journalists, and the general public. Um, so our interest is in coming up with very applied policy recommendations for things that can be done differently. Um, Brookings covers a very wide range of topic areas. I'm an urban economist. I study housing markets, housing policy, affordability, land use regulation. Um, I have colleagues who study foreign policy, economics, uh, governance studies. I have some colleagues who spend a lot of time thinking about things like the filibuster and the way Congress is structured. Um, I have colleagues who study transportation and infrastructure. So Brookings is one of the larger think tanks and one of the older think tanks since so we cover a very wide range of territory. There are other think tanks that are more narrowly focused on particular issues. Um, we are also, I would say, a, a pretty centrist think tank. So I have colleagues who are Democrats and Republicans, uh, but probably not on the extreme side of either one of the parties. Um, and we are nonpartisan. We offer advice to any public official elected or appointed who comes and asks us for advice. Um, so I spend my time partly doing research, um, some quantitative research, a lot of writing, and writing aimed very much at a public audience. So I do a lot of blog, blog posts, uh, short research briefs. I spend a really unhealthy amount of my time on Twitter. Um, which is in fact part of my job because that's how I reach a lot of people. That's how we develop an audience and get ideas out there. I also spend a fair amount of time talking with policymakers 
at all levels of government. I talked to city council members and mayors all the way up to um, congressional staff, testifying to Congress, talking to federal agencies. Uh, I talked to journalists quite a lot because that's also a way to get information out there. Um, so all, all of the sort of public facing stuff is part of my job. And I will say that uh, to, to be at a think tank, you need to have not only substantive expertise, deep, deep substantive expertise in an area, um, you need to have good research skills, uh, either quantitative or qualitative. And probably most importantly of all, you need to be a good writer and able to communicate well with people. Um, because our job really in, in some sense is taking a lot of research ideas from academia um, that's written, you know, econ papers are written with a lot of Greek letters and regression tables. Turns out nobody in Congress will read an econ paper. Um, members of Congress do not understand regressions. And so the idea is to tell them the take home point that they need to know um, and then think about how to translate some of these ideas directly into policy. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit to uh, try to connect better to your, uh, your UVA days. And if I were to really geek out, I would have to confess that what first hooked me on macroeconomics was when I started to shift IS and LM curves and it made me feel incredibly powerful. I've gotten over that feeling since then, but um, I'm wondering whether each of you could reflect on uh, what inspired you to get into economics. And then to the extent that you can, if you can comment on what kinds of paths might take students from where they are now to where you are now, um, that would be very helpful as well. Uh, let's uh, mix it up. Luis, you go first. Yeah, yeah, no, sounds good. Um, you know, I, I probably should have even included a little bit about, you know, kind of what, what we do within within Nike. So, I mean, obviously, you know, I'll kind of tap, tap, uh, piggyback on, on, on maybe some of the other stuff, but it's, I mean, you know, Nike just in general, I mean, I, I, I didn't go too much into it because I think folks have an idea of what it is, but, you know, our, I, our mission is to bring innovation and inspiration to every athlete in the world. And, and, and if you have a body, you're an athlete, right? And so the, the mission of the company is, uh, is, is it, that, that mission kind of drives us to do everything possible to really expand human potential, right? And we do that by, you know, creating kind of groundbreaking apparel and sport and, and footwear innovations, and we make them more sustainably, right? We create a, a diverse, you know, global team, and, and obviously we make a, a positive impact in global communities where we live and where we work. So in terms of kind of, you know, what we do and kind of what's, what's you know, kind of my job, you know, corporate social responsibility is an interesting, um, um, field. It's a very niche field, right? And you can come to it from lots of different places. So there's places, there are companies that have corporate social responsibility, robust corporate social responsibility uh, uh, teams, where the people that sit on those teams come from all walks of pro professional life. They can come from NGOs, they can come from think tanks, they can come from uh, the, the, you know, marketing or operations or finance or other parts throughout the company. You can, you can become kind of a functional expert, right? So that's somebody who, you know, you're really good at something like communications or you're really good at operations or you're really good at marketing or you're really good at finance, or you can come in as a subject matter expertise. So if a company like Nike, we, our focus is on, on, on addressing the physical inactivity epidemic. So for people who have expertise uh, in that area of getting people active and what that looks like, right? Those are types of people you would be able to come in and work at Nike as a subject matter expertise in our corporate social responsibility team to be able to provide that type of insight. So there are lots of different ways that you can get to a corporate social responsibility career. What I would say is that, you know, in my line of work, you know, being the smartest or the loudest person in the room doesn't necessarily translate to success. And I do think that there are, there are a couple of things and particularly with economics, which would certainly help me out. Um, yeah, I think it's the ability to analyze a problem, come up with a solution, articulate it, and then work across the organization to actually execute a solution, right? And so I think what was interesting, you know, in, in economics was I think for me at UVA was, 
at a very, very top line level, kind of understanding how people use resources and respond to incentives and getting into a little bit of how people make decisions. So for me, looking at all those different frameworks and, 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 and ways of being able to think through that, I think it's been able to help when you get into larger organizations like I've, I've been a part of, like the US government, Walmart, and Nike, I, you really have to know how to work with lots of different people and be able to kind of get across a, a solution across the finish line. And that is not easy. It's, 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 it's knowing when to push, when to pull back, when to, you know, when to talk at a meeting and when to go big and when to pull back. I mean, there, there are lots of different um, aspects to it. But again, um, in the interest of time, I'll... Uh, I'll... Uh, Caitlin, would you like to go next? Sure, I think the question was sort of about our path here. And um, I was always micro, actually. I loved how it worked on a smaller scale. Um, I fell in love with econ, with the economics of welfare reform, the economics of education. Um, my fourth year, I served as a research assistant for Professor Turner in the economics of education, and I loved it. And I really, honestly, when I, when I started at UVA, didn't really even understand what economics was. <laughs> hadn't had much of a grounding in it. It wasn't a course offered at my high school, but I, I fell in love with it. And I really fell in love with uh, the economics of education. But I'd never been out of the country and I decided, you know what, I really wanna make a difference. So I joined the Peace Corps. I went overseas as a small business development volunteer. I thought it was ridiculous to serve in that capacity when I was set up with a um, cooperative that couldn't read or write. So again, the importance of education. I came back, I went to Columbia, got my master's of public administration, started on an education focus, but ended up with um, an econ focus actually, because a lot of the stuff I was learning as a graduate student at Columbia, focusing on urban and social policy, taking classes at, at Columbia's teacher's college, I was reading some of the same things I read in undergrad at UVA. So I switched to econ and said, this is really what I like. It's the analytical focus it's a different way of looking at it. I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. I wasn't well suited for that. I wanted to be in the background, but I liked the focus of how do we take a problem within this social sector and analyze it and make decisions that, you know, in the social, in the public sphere, we know are important decisions. We know they can be very emotional decisions, but we need to take a critical eye to it. So I left Columbia, I joined the DOE um, and worked across a couple different offices, a couple different divisions as director of analytics, looking at some of that data and dealing with a lot of ancient data systems and um, folks on the ground having different work and different ways of thinking about the data and also how we interact with the public, how we interact with elected officials on public proposals, on what we want to accomplish. I left the DOE, worked in, at another nonprofit again, um, leading some of the programming. And now, as I, as I mentioned before, I'm at another nonprofit, a social services org, and have expanded beyond education, but still in that um, public sector sphere. So uh, sort of to follow Luis, I think exactly what he said, it's about analyzing a problem, taking a critical lens to it, um, and being able to know how to reach people. But I really got involved because of the economics of education and economics of welfare reform at UVA. Thank you. Um, Jenny, you've also had an interesting uh, path to get to where you are now. Would you tell us about it? Uh, yes, my, my parents keep expecting me to find a job that I stay in for more than five years, and so far that hasn't happened, um, which is maybe one way of saying don't expect to find your, your lifelong uh, dream job, the first one you get out of college. Uh, it's okay to bounce around. Uh, so I, I would say I didn't, um, I didn't find my corner of econ in undergrad. Um, I didn't know enough to kind of distinguish between the theory courses and the empirical courses. Uh, um, I think the, the econ advising has gotten better since I went through. My, my favorite two econ classes in undergrad were stats and economic history. Um, stats is you know, sort of a really powerful set of tools. The idea that you can use data to describe problems and that there are different tools for data and different ways to cut the data. Um, you know, that, that's a, a pretty powerful tool in all kinds of social sciences. Um, 
And econ history was really interesting to me because I hadn't thought about the fact that you could explain sort of really big trends in history and really big events like slavery and the Civil War in economic terms. Um, so the idea that both people and firms have particular financial incentives. And if you understand what the financial incentives are of individual people and kind of groups of people, you can explain really large things that happen in history. Um, so I, yeah, I didn't have a particularly strong focus within econ as an undergrad. I got hired uh, by another UVA econ alum um, coming out to work at a company called Apt Associates, which is a, a fairly small policy research and consulting firm uh, with headquarters in DC and Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And they hired me to work in their public housing strategic consulting group, which was something I'd never thought of before. Uh, I didn't know anything about public housing or housing policy. I didn't know anything about real estate or cities. So this was really kind of a shot in the dark, um, but it turned out to be a fantastic job, both because I got to work with a bunch of different senior people on lots of projects, um, but also because I got a sense of what the economics are behind cities. Um, so uh, my sort of, you know, come to Jesus moment in economics was learning about what we call the standard urban model, which basically says that people are willing to pay a lot of money for housing that's close to their job, um, that land is more valuable in places where people and, and firms are more productive, and that you can explain the built environment, the patterns of cities where you have tall buildings and short buildings and where real estate values are higher based on what people want to live close to. Um, and that's on, in one sense a very basic intuition. People will be willing to pay, pay more to live by the beach or to live by their office than way out in the middle of nowhere. But it's, it's a really profound truth. And it turns out that that drives an awful lot of how cities look all over the world. Uh, so my, my job at Apt Associates gave me a little taste of how housing markets and, and cities work. I went back to graduate school to get a master's in city planning and then a PhD in public policy more or less to get better research tools, to get stronger stat skills, to read the economics research so that I understood what had been done before um, and you know, sort of figuring out research questions that I wanted to ask. Um, so I've worked at, at a private sector company. I worked in a public sector company. I taught at a university before I came to Brookings. Um, and part of, I, I think, what's important when you come out of college is to find a job that fits you, not just in the subject matter that you work in, but also the work environment. Um, there are really big differences to working in a public sector organization, especially a big one. They're very bureaucratic, they're very rules-based. Uh, people tend to have very defined responsibilities for what they do, and you do a lot of, can wind up doing a lot of the same thing over and over again. Um, private sector companies have generally a lot more flexibility in what they do. Um, and uh, there, there are advantages to both of those. Nonprofits are somewhere in between, but I think it's worth it when you come out of college to take a job that seems like it'll be interesting day to day, where it'll give you a chance to do things, including different kinds of project types and working with different people and just see whether you like it. <laughs> um, so I have changed jobs pretty often um, and always because there's something new and different that I haven't tried before that sounds interesting. Um, and so I think there's value to sort of letting yourself be exposed to a couple of different work environments and see what's a good fit. Good, and Matt, maybe you can tell us what inspired you, your interest in economics. And I'd also like to hear from your cat, <laughs> which is uh, in the background there. Yeah, yeah, he's tucked himself <laughs> away in the bed. Hopefully there'll be a, there may be a dog that wanders by as well. Um, so in terms of my initial inspiration at, at, at the university around economics, I don't, you know, to be honest, I don't, I don't recall anything as precise as shifting ISLM curves around. I know that I, I was always drawn to social sciences. So I, I took a lot of psychology and sociology and economics courses. And I think the appeal to me in economics was the sort of analytical rigor and, and, and purity uh, to it, to, to, to lay out a set of assumptions for, um, you know, around people's preferences, around the constraints that they face, the incentives that they face, and sort of reasoning your way through what sort of outcomes you'll get either at the individual level or the, or the firm level. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so that wound up taking me, like I got very interested in sort of applying the tools of economics to the study of other social sciences, so the sort of Gary Becker type stuff, looking at issues in criminology, as well as the incorporation in the economics of insights from other social sciences. So the sort of behavioral 
economics, where you're drawing on, on insights from psychology and other fields. Um, I had a bit of an unusual path. So, so it, right after I graduated from UVA, um, I, I went to New York City and, and wound up working in, in advertising and marketing strategy for a couple of years. Um, and was in um, an area of the, the marketing world that was that was sort of more quantitatively oriented and rigorous. And this was a um, also a time when online advertising and marketing was becoming a thing and you could sort of use the tools that I'd acquired to sort of think about and, and look at how people respond to different messages in different environments. And you could sort of closely measure the, the, the return that those um, marketing investments would have. I, it, as, as sort of over time, I was drawn sort of back into to economics and just in my, my, um, my spare time was, was doing, you know, more and more independent reading and, and uh, eventually decided to, to pursue a PhD in economics. And that, so that was a couple of years out of college. I think it's, um, you know, at the time, at least it was a relatively unconventional path back into a, an econ PhD program. So I, I went to Johns Hopkins um, and, and did a, a PhD um, one of the things I learned in working on my dissertation was that um, that can be a very sort of solitary um, endeavor. And, uh, and I really liked and, and was energized by doing research and analysis. Um, but I sort of liked the first couple months of working on a problem um, and, uh, and, um, and, and wanted to work on very policy relevant sort of topical issues. And so, um, it, you know, it, it, it turned out that the um, the markets group of the New York Fed was an excellent place to, to do that, to both apply, you know, the, the tools that I, that I built out, the knowledge that I'd learned, but also work on sort of more timely, topical, shorter term analytical projects. Um, and so I joined, uh, I joined in 2007 and have been in just a variety of different roles at the New York Fed and, and briefly at the Board of Governors since. So that was my path in terms of like other paths into at least my, my world of the Fed. Um, we, hire, um, we hire undergraduates. Um, uh, we hire uh, folks with directly out of graduate school and then we hire um, experienced professionals. Most of the, the hiring that we're doing out of, you know, out of uh, undergraduate or graduate programs are people who have studied um, economics, international affairs, public policy, um, usually with, you know, sort of a quantitative element to, to, to the work that they've done. In terms of the experience hires, those are generally for us people, uh, just by virtue of the role that I have um, in, in, in the Fed, those are typically people who are working in financial markets. They're either um, at a, a bank um, doing research or analysis, or they work in an in, in investment capacity. Um, Okay, thank you all. Um, we're at the point now where I stop asking questions and we turn to the students' questions. And uh, Caitlin Ackerman has some that I think the students have raised and she's going to talk now. Yes, so we've been getting a lot of questions um, throughout the panel. And if any student has any other questions that they'd like to ask, uh, please DM them or message me those questions. But I'll start with um, a question that we got for Luis um, saying, how have you been able to integrate your passion for promoting Latinx, uh, the Latinx community representation into your work now? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I do believe that brands like Nike and big companies have a, have a really important role to play um, in partnering with, with government and NGOs to solve seemingly intractable challenges, right? I mean, look at, look at our government right now. I mean, it's, it's in many places in gridlock, right? And so I think a lot of folks are turning to brands and, and others to look at how, how, how to address some of these challenges, right? And if you look at even some of the insights, you know, 79% or over 80% over of Gen Z consumers believe that brands like Nike play an important role in society and are actually responsible for making it better. And that's compared with 28% that think that they should just focus in on money. 
And then 79% of millennials consider a company's uh, consider a company's social environmental commitment when deciding where to work, right? So that's just a kind of another 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 data point. But you know, the the the, the thought here is is that you know you you are able to I think through the the a megaphone that Nike has and and the inspiration and the different ways that we can connect. Uh, with the public, you have ways to be able to kind of craft that narrative and craft your work within the company to be a model for society, right? And to uh, connect or collaborate with government and NGOs on these types of things. So as it, spe as it specifically relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, Nike is doing a lot, right? I think Nike struggles sometimes to have its internal efforts match its external efforts. We do a really good job in, in, in underserved communities and working with governments and NGOs and partnering with them to address issues um, that, that come up and challenges that come up for those communities. But I think sometimes even internally at Nike, uh, we talk a big game, but sometimes we don't back it up, right? We, uh, and so I think there's a huge effort right now internally to ensure that you know we are kind of you know practicing what we preach, and that that means just to give you an example for Latinx community. We have a company of seventy five thousand people, and we have twelve Latino VPs, twelve, right? And that you know you look at that, and that's a I, I, you know you you all are the economists with three percent, maybe something like that in terms of uh, you know what that what that is. And if you look at the the, the Latinx population within the United States, I mean we're at around seventeen percent. So even that's not not really representative. But what I would say is that I think Nike recognizes that, um, and we are you know there's a, there's a very robust effort which I'm a part of right now to increase representation within Nike, um, and and that that is important because if we put uh, you know uh, people in our Latinx community in positions within the company to make decisions around what kind of activities we're, we're, we're engaging in, what is the lens that we need to look at things through. Um, I think that's only gonna help. I would say this as well uh, before I, I pass it off is that um, in companies, and just like there was in government, I was at USAID, the United States Agency for International Development where I lived abroad and worked out of embassies and managed US foreign aid. So that's a whole different thing. But um, you know what, what we, within big companies like Nike, there are what are called employee resource groups. So lots of underserved communities, um, or, or there's, there's, there's a handful of underserved communities that have an employee resource group. Latinx community is one of them at Nike, Native American community, the black community, women. Uh, and there's, there's, I think, 10 or 12 that we have. And I serve as the co-chair for a Latino employee resource group. So, you know, we are tasked with helping to increase representation within Nike. So we, we work very closely with our Latino VPs, with, with human resources, with our diversity and inclusion team at broader Nike to bring programming, to bring awareness to Nike employees about what we're doing, about the importance of the Latinx community uh, and how to make sure that, you know, kind of our lens is being taken into consideration as we, you know, kind of roll out our products and everything like that. So um, this is a question for all of our panelists. Um, how has COVID changed the trajectory of the projects that you've been working on and have there been any permanent changes in your company or organizations as a result of the pandemic? And we can start with Caitlin, if that's all right. Sure, happy to. Um, so my role as Director of Strategic Initiatives at Children's Aid has me working on um, three to four different initiatives at any given time, one of which that's been constant throughout is data integration across the agency. But one that came about about a year ago is um, my role on the pandemic response team, actually, and leading that work. It's been fascinating. We are a large, about 140 million um, in revenues, social services agency in New York City. We have about 2,500 employees, which, you know, if you're comparing to Nike, not, not so big, but for New York City and a social services agency, that's quite large. We have full-timers, we have part-timers, and we have folks across um, varying different backgrounds and um, scopes of work. We, we are an essential agency here in New York. We've never closed. We've, we have 40 some sites across the city and over half of them have been open the entire time. 
So we've been focusing on how do we open sites that weren't already open and how do we keep our staff safe? We're also now dealing with the vaccines and how to roll those out and how to do so in an equitable manner. Our staff are eligible for vaccines. Most of our staff are eligible for vaccines here in New York right now. And we have a number that have received them, but um, one thing we're grappling with right now is actually having folks take that vaccine. We put a survey out of our 2,500 staff, I don't know if this surprises anyone, we had about 25 that said, yes, sign me up, I want that vaccine. We had about 25 that said, nope, I'm not getting that vaccine no matter what. And we had about 50% of our staff that said, eh, maybe. I either need more information or I need more time. And I also wanna put that into context because the vast majority of the youth and the families that we serve through our foster care, through our education, through our health services are black and brown. Our communities are black and brown. And so we are trying to deal with the, uh, some ways justifiable mistrust of the medical community um, in America and putting out informational campaigns to both staff and clients around COVID. Um, so that's been an ongoing piece since the pandemic began, it's information, and now with the vaccines, it's focused on information around vaccines. I don't know if I completely answered your question there. Um, I could talk about how it works for our building safety. I could talk about how it works for um, policies and staff working remotely versus not. Um, but by and large, I think the big, one of the biggest takeaways from COVID is that we can work differently. We, as a social services agency, we were always, we were trained to be in person, to always work in person. And I've been to the office, I could count on one hand since last March, whereas the vast majority of our staff have continued to come in. So the big questions are, what does that mean going forward? When do we come back for those that haven't been in the office? What's the uptake? I think we've learned that things can be different, but we haven't quite figured out how and what we're going to do once we um, cross that next step. Yeah, so Matt, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, as I reflect on COVID, I guess there are two, two aspects um, um, via which it's had a big impact on, on my work, on our work. I mean, the first is the, um, the pandemic itself, obviously, uh, has had an enormous impact on the U.S. economy, on the global economy, um, and on financial markets. I mean, when back, as I look back to, to early March of last year, um, it was a scary time uh, in financial markets. I mean, I, I don't know how closely this group would would be following that, but um, I, I I worked at the here at the New York Fed back in 2007, 2008 during the global financial what we refer to as the global financial crisis. And what we saw last March to me was um, um, miles more frightening just in terms of the, the, the speed um, and, and, um, and breadth of the issues. And, and it really hit at the core of our financial system. And so it was kind of, you know, at the same time, so, so it, was, it was an incredibly busy time. We were uh, I think fortunately, because of the experience that we'd had in 2007 and 2008, I think be better position to respond um, quickly and, and forcefully than we, than we otherwise would have been. But it was an incredibly um, fraught time um, from that perspective professionally. And then on top of that, of course, we were going into lockdown and working from home um, and you know, thinking about our own health and the health of our friends and family. Um, and so, you know, those two things coming together uh, just um, um, were, were enormously ch challenging. I mean, in terms of, you know, the more durable impact on through our work arrangements, I've been working from home um, since then. I've been into the office, I think, once or, or twice since March. I think that's generally true of, of the, the, the vast majority of my colleagues at, at the New York Fed and throughout the Federal Reserve System. And I, it's been, I, I've, I've been um, struck at how, uh, at how well it's gone. I mean, it's actually been a lot um, smoother and we've learned to work remotely much more effectively than I would have guessed. And I think that's not just true of, of the Fed. I mean, one of the, you know, we talked to a lot of 
of um, of uh, market participants, people who work in in the financial sector in various capacities. And I, I mean, to me, that's kind of a a message I hear from almost everyone is how how much. Uh, easier it has been and more smoothly it has gone to, to go to a work from home posture than people understood. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know how long we'll, we'll, we'll be like this. Um, I, I don't uh, expect that I'll return to the office probably until the, the fall at the soonest. And I think thereafter, this will have sort of a durable impact on the way that we work. I, I would guess that um, Many of the, the people that I work with will, will never go back to a world in which they're in the office five days a week. I mean, again, we've learned that we can work um, effectively uh, remotely. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's an interesting question to think about what sort of durable impact that's gonna have on how we work going forward. Nice, um, Jenny. Sure. Uh, so a lot of what we do at Brookings is sort of watch what's going on in the real world, in both policy world and in the economic world. Um, and it turns out COVID has had some really big impacts on housing markets. Um, there was actually a, an article in the New York Times this morning called Where Have All the Houses Gone, which gives a nice overview of maybe three or four really bizarre trends going on in housing markets all at the same time. Um, so. Uh, as Matthew pointed out, many of us are now working from home and people who live in places like DC and New York and San Francisco that are really expensive housing markets who were mostly living in pretty small spaces um, because that's what they could afford and have a short commute. It turns out when you don't have to commute to the office five days a week, you can move someplace that's a little farther away from work. And if you're working at home all the time, you wanna have a separate room that's a home office. Um, if they're, you know, it's a family with more than one worker, they may want two home offices. Um, so the desire to have more space in your home and not being tethered to a location that's convenient for your commute changes housing markets, right? This turns a lot of stuff that we take for granted upside down. So people have been moving out of some of the most expensive cities to places in the suburbs or even to cheaper cities elsewhere um, to take advantage of lower housing prices and have more space. Uh, that's for the people who are lucky enough to still have jobs um, and have well-paid mostly white collar jobs that they can do from home. The flip side is lots of people lost their jobs, um, people who work in service sectors, so food service has absolutely been killed, leisure and hospitality, all of the kinds of things where you have to have in-person interaction. Um, people have lost their jobs, which means they're not getting income. Most of the, the sort of lower wage workers who lost their jobs were renters. Um, and so there has been a rental crisis. Um, if you've been paying attention to the headlines, um, roughly nine or 10 million renters are now behind on their rent and owe more than $5,000 per household in back rent. Um, there's a federal eviction moratorium, which last night uh, a court decided to waive. Um, so there are potentially a whole bunch of people who are about to lose their homes. Um, and there's a you know sort of a lot of upheaval in the real estate industry. What does this mean for things like sales transactions when you can't do open houses and people don't want to have closing in the same room? Um, so real estate markets have been going a little bit nuts, and you know a chunk of my job in the last year has been looking at the data, um, trying to figure out what's going on, uh, realizing that we don't have a lot of the data that we need to answer this. We have absolutely terrible real-time data on household level well-being. The Census Bureau has started a whole new survey to try to get a sense of how many people are behind on their rent or their mortgage, which we had never been tracking in real time before. And it turns out that's really important to know. Um, so it, you know, this is sort of intellectually an exciting time to be studying housing markets because there's so much going on that's really new and different. It's also a pretty terrifying time. Um, and in particular, you know, I, I study rental markets and I spend a lot of time thinking about the fact that there are people who are on the verge of being evicted and there's no good answer, right? They don't have money. Their landlords can't pay the mortgage and the property taxes. So the landlords are also financially strapped. Um, and it's gonna be really bad for society if we wind up with a ton of people who are either homeless or living in very crowded conditions during a pandemic because they can't afford to pay the rent. Um, so I spend also a lot of time yelling at Congress to send people checks um, so that we don't wind up with these sort of social crises and have to fix them. Um, and Congress, as it turns out, does not listen to me as much as I would like them to. Yeah, 
Yeah, and then lose. Yeah, well, co Congress doesn't know what they're doing if they're not listening to you, Jenny. That's uh, um, okay. Well, look, real quick. Um, so, so for Nike, obviously there was a big impact because you know we shut down a lot of our stores, physical stores. Um, so actually, but what what ended up happening was that our digital sales, you know, went through the roof, and they continued to be like that. And it was part of our strategy anyway, was to go more direct to consumer. So we've been building a lot of our kind of digital infrastructure, our apps, our community member apps, and so um, you know, uh, we've adapted, and, and like, like like many other companies. Um, so I think you know, in in the end, it's actually probably going to be a nice catalyst to where. We were going anyway, uh, and you know there's going to be a nice hybrid between kind of you know they call it omni-channel. So you, you you'll be able to kind of go in into the stores and kind of have a different experience in the stores. It'll be more experiential. Um, you know it won't be like a Walmart where you see everything and you, you just you know it's kind of nicely curated to the city and to where you're at, and you'll be able to have a lot larger kind of inventory online and, and through the app. Uh, I would say for structure. Um, you know, I, if anybody's ever able to come out to our world headquarters in Beaverton, it's awesome. It's, it's like a college campus. There's, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, soccer fields and basketball courts and climbing walls and volleyball sand pits and everything. And it's, it's crazy. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's really nice. And I think what a lot of that stuff, you know, is there for is to really uh, foment community. And so Nike for a lot of the jobs that we have, you really do need other people and you don't need to be around others to kind of spark that innovation and to um, kind of get work done in teams. And so I agree with, you know, the other panelists. I mean, a lot of what we've been able to do, you can do online, you can do through Zoom. Um, but, you know, I think what, what, what COVID has done is it's changed kind of what we're doing. So we, Nike, like government and like others, you know, used to have kind of cubes, you know, where you kind of go in and have your cube and, you know, you'd say hi to the other person, you know, it's kind of that type of deal. Um, but I think what Nike and many other companies are probably going to get smart about is post COVID, you know, what we're doing is we're essentially um, kind of minimizing the number of buildings and footprint that we're going to have. And so the, the footprint that we do have though, it's not gonna be cubes, it's gonna be freestyle, it's gonna be even more kind of open and uh, kind of leading people to kind of create spark ideas so that you know, we'll probably be in the office maybe two times a week, maybe three, depending on you know, kind of how things go. And the rest you'll be able to work from home, right? Um, and so I think when you actually do go into work, it's going to be one of these things where it'll be for like a, a team brainstorming session or a strategy session where you need kind of other people, right? And not that you can't do that online. There's Miro, there's all these cool tools, but there is something to be said for leveraging the unique assets and capabilities that at least at Nike we have within our campus environment. And then being able to mix that with, you know, um, just kind of the spark of innovation. In terms of COVID for, for, for our job and for my job, we've, we've been, this has been, I mean, huge for Nike, right? To kind of go out and do things. We shifted production for our, for our shoes and um, for like the airbags that you see in an Air Max and like a Nike shoe, we use that technology to uh, come up with face masks, right? To create face masks. So we actually change production in our manufacturing facilities here in the US, here in Beaverton and in St. Louis to make face masks, right? And so we donated them and it was, you know, thousands and thousands uh, to hospitals all across the country. Uh, you know, we've gotten involved with employee engagement. That's another big part of my job and kind of what we do is we have 75,000 people that we can deploy out into the community. So we get them donating their time and their treasure and their talent. So we've been able to kind of, you know, do this, you know, through COVID but then also virtually kind of coming up with those virtual engagement and volunteer opportunities, which has been a real boon. Um, we've, we've come up with different uh, lines of shoes for nurses and for medical workers, and we provided them at no cost to a lot of you know, those folks, particularly here in the US in New York City and LA. And then finally, um, we, <laughs> we had a lot of uh, unused miles for employees that were traveling from you know, site to site. So we had a lot of unused miles last year because everything was just shut down. So we have millions and millions of dollars worth of miles on carriers like Delta and United. And so you know, what we decided to do is like sweep all of those up, 
put them in a, in a gift card or a debit card, and we've donated them to some of our partners like the NAACP and others that are working for COVID relief, right? So there are really innovative ways. Oh, and our world headquarters is gonna be a public um, vaccination site this weekend. So that was really, really new. And we were working on that. So there are lots of different ways, if you think creatively, that a company, a company like Nike can use its resources and unique assets and capabilities to, to, to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. The last thing I'll say, and I know I've taken a lot of your time, but I would say this, think about what you're passionate about. You can do nothing wrong out of a UVA, you know, econ degree, unless it's illegal, of course, right? But it, literally you can do nothing, it, just be very intentional about the skills that you want to get out of the experience that you're getting, right? And you can test, I agree with Jenny. I've, I've, I've not stayed in a job more than five years, right? But, but the reason why is it's kind of, I've started out here and thought that I wanted to do a whole bunch of stuff. I was a Peace Corps volunteer like Caitlin. And you just, you kind of go like this, right? You figure out what you like and you test it. And you're like, mm, maybe I didn't like comms. Mm, maybe I didn't like data analysis. And you just, you get closer to what you want. Yeah, so it looks like we have time for just about one more question. Um, so, what types of jobs or internships should students um, be looking at if they want to enter your field or get hired by your employer? Um, and kind of backing off on that, um, what types of skill sets do you think that um, our students should be should be learning? Um, and so if anyone wanted to jump in first, um, take a piece Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a crack at this. Um, so I think the first job out of college should be something that you're excited to do and that gives you a chance to try new things, right? You don't know yet. There are a whole bunch of career fields that you don't even know exist. And so it's impossible to go looking for something that you don't know about yet. Just find something that's interesting. And as Louise said, there's some stuff that you'll like and there's some stuff that you won't like and you'll make some decisions and go forward from there. Um, you know, it's always good to have technical skills because almost every job requires some of it. So you don't have to be a fantastic programmer, but know how to work with data. Don't be afraid to try a new software package. Um, learning how to teach yourself new skills, particularly on the technical side is really important because all of that changes. Um, so, you know, try a little bit of coding, do some data work. Uh, and really, really do learn how to be a good writer. Um, once you graduate from college, nobody is going to grade your papers and mark them up, but you will get hired for more jobs and you will get promotions if you know how to write and communicate well. Um, learning some public speaking is also useful. So this is sort of a, a full range of skills, but most jobs want you to have skills in more than one area. Um, you know, unless you're going to be a very technical person, you need to have a range of skills. And so give yourself a chance to try all of them and then figure out where you want to focus and specialize. Great. Does anyone else want to uh, answer the question? I know we only have a couple minutes left. All right, well then I'll just end the panel. Um, thank you, Professor Leeper and our panelists for coming today and spending the time speaking with us. Uh, students, if you're interested in continuing the conversation with one of our panelists, I'll, um, Chloe will be posting a Google Sheet in the chat for office hour sessions. Uh, right now, all of our slots are full, um, but you are more than welcome to join a wait list for um, those office hour sessions. And so um, alums, we kindly ask you to stay on the Zoom call um, for breakout rooms. Caitlin, I'd, I'd like to uh, just add one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think students don't, aren't, aren't fully aware of this, but one of the really special things about economics at UVA is the economics career office. They are putting this on and they have tremendous resources available to students. And uh, this really does differentiate econ at UVA from econ and most other universities. So please take advantage of the career office first by starting you know, with what's on the web page, and then get to know the people in the office who are really terrific. 
And I thought the panel was really terrific. And I think in addition to showing you the, the broad cross section of what you can do with an economics degree, the one common theme is they were all articulate. <laughs> they talk good. And you got to be able to get your thoughts across in talk in, verbally and, and in writing. And that's something to put a lot of energy into. So I think Jenny said that beautifully. Thank you.